Dear John, this is a little embarrassing. We have never met. How could we? You've been gone a long time. 232 years to be precise. Still, it's fallen to me to let you know that you are remembered and revered. You had only one son, and I understand that that relationship was, well, a little bit complicated. I suppose there's nothing unusual in it. You were away a lot of the time after all, and he was raised as a child in care, though not the care of the state, obviously. You were a very wealthy man after all. In any case, you might be surprised to know that there are thousands of us that, although we're not in your bloodline, nonetheless bear your name. Tens of thousands, in fact, all over the world, in places farther away than even you can imagine. John, I think these might even be love letters of a sort, from us to you, from now to then. But let's not get too misty-eyed about it. All we have to admire are facsimiles of you. The version of you left behind in your writings. The versions the historians compose. And also this strange and fascinating statue. John Howard in marble. John Howard at St Paul's Cathedral, no less. I wonder what you'd make of that. I'm looking right at you now, and I confess I'm suppressing a giggle. I can't believe they dressed you in a robe and sandals. You were no Aristotle, no Socrates, neither philosopher nor scientist. Most of all, I think you were a curious traveller. Curious in both senses of the word. But you'd have needed warmer clothes and stout shoes for journeying into the dark places you visited. Is that why I sense some reluctance in your pose on the plinth? You seem, oddly, a little on the back foot, somehow. At the same time, there's something else in your face, in the eyes in particular. The curiosity is there, for sure, but also kindness, perhaps even hope, more of which later. Until then, please accept this assurance of my sincere admiration and respect. P.S. I'm half Howard myself, on my mother's side. She too is dead, but yet loved. Dear John, Remember what I said about not being too misty-eyed? Well, it's not that I lied in my last letter. It's just that I left some things out. My sense is that you were not a fan of half-truths and omissions. You went to the dark places to see, with your own eyes, what you would find, to bring it into the light. You were not content to leave prisons and prisoners unseen and unconsidered. Your curiosity catalogued the deprivations, the indignities, the disease and the suffering that you found in meticulous, idiosyncratic detail. The bread ration, the space, the light the quality of air. You cared enough to notice, to count, and to record it all. The scroll in your left hand reminds me of that. So let me clear the air between us, as it were. It is true, as I said in my last letter, that you have tens of thousands of followers all over the world, all of them striving for an end to those dark places, or at least for their lightening. But And now I'm really embarrassed. I have to confess, we haven't been entirely successful. This is going to come as a nasty shock, I'm sure, but there's no way to sugarcoat it. John, there are almost a 100,000 people in prisons, in our kingdom united only, it seems, in anger, fear and disgust. Across Europe, more than one in every thousand citizens is in prison now. That's more than one and a half million people. Two million in the now independent United States of America. There are so many prisons, John. Not even someone with your energy and commitment could visit them all. In these islands alone, there are 141 prisons. And there are plans to build more. You're probably hoping that in the last 232 years we've at least made these places more humane, more sanitary, more productive. Well... Yes and no. The prison inspectors and visitors and researchers that follow in your footsteps might concur that physical conditions have improved somewhat, but our prisons are overcrowded, 
understaffed, expensive and ineffective, much too often they debilitate and disable the people inside them, both prisoners and staff. Perhaps you're thinking we must face enormous crime problems that require this repression. No, that's not the reason why prisons have persisted and grown. Crime rates have been mostly stable or falling for decades now. You'll probably want to ask how is it possible that we haven't managed to come up with better ways to respond to crime in the near quarter of a millennium since your passing. Well, the truth is that we do keep inventing clever sounding so-called alternatives. But unfortunately, when we invest in these ideas and see them grow, they become supplementary punishment, not substitutes for it. That's why, as well as the 100,000 in prison, we now have well over a quarter of a million people under penal supervision in the community in the United Kingdom. There are other reasons, John, complex reasons for the mess we're in. But to give you a simple analogy that I think you would relate to, given your health problems, we have cultivated the unhealthiest of appetites. We feast on the suffering of others because we're taught to be afraid of them and because we've been sold the lie that they are not us and we are not them. I can't imagine how disappointing this must be for you to hear. I'm so sorry, John. I'll write again soon, perhaps with better news. Until then, I remain your affectionate admirer. P.S. Speaking of healthy and unhealthy diets, it might amuse you to know that lots of people nowadays, like you, have forsworn eating meat, and some avoid dairy products too. Vegans, we call them. I think you might approve of that development at least. Dear John, it's St Andrew's Day in Scotland. Did I say I was writing from Glasgow? Perhaps the accent gave me away. I promised you better news, but on my radio this morning... Oh, wait a minute. I should explain. A radio is a device that allows you to hear voices in your home that are transmitted, sometimes live and sometimes recorded, from people some distance away. You can even transmit these signals across oceans, continents, all around the world. It's amazing how technology has changed our lives and how much has stayed the same. Anyway, on my radio this morning, they were talking about the news in Scotland today that the numbers of people dying in Scottish prisons have risen again in the last three years. Some die by suicide or through the misuse of the illegal substances that they use to ease the pains of their confinement. Some die because of difficulties accessing proper health care. The last couple of years have been especially grim. A global pandemic led to people in prison being locked up in their cells with little to do, often for 23 hours a day. We're only beginning to count the cost of that additional suffering. And no one seems to have noticed the injustice of making their punishment so much more severe. But speaking of severe punishment, I will bring you some better news. We might still be shortening and damaging lives with imprisonment, but we have at least abolished the death penalty. That happened in 1965, 99 years after the Penal Reform Association that still bears your name was formed. I hope you approve. Something else in the news reminded me of you. You'll recall the city of Herson. Of course you will. Did you know, by the way, that St Andrew also visited there? It wasn't his last stop like it was for you. Herson was where merely visiting prisons finally proved fatal in your case. It was typhus that you contracted, I'm told. I'm sorry about that too. Sadly, Herson's back in the news because men of violence are bombing it. They say that the violence is legitimate. They say they are targeting the resources that give power and succour to their enemies. Most of us don't believe they are under any threat at all. What we do believe is that they don't care that the bombs and the blackouts endanger people who bear no arms and have done no wrong. Collateral damage, they call it. I suppose you were yourself that kind of unintended casualty. Your death was a collateral consequence of the imprisonment of others. The violence of punishment still produces many of those casualties, John. Children deprived of parents, parents of children, lovers of one another, communities deprived of the energy and potential of their own people, even the released prisoners deprived of a future by the stain that punishment leaves. 
In the marble version of you at St Paul's, you're holding a key in your right hand, and the chains lie discarded at your feet. In my first letter, I joked about the Greek robe they dressed you in and said you were neither a philosopher nor a scientist. Well, now I wonder if the joke's on me. The thing is, they do dress me up in robes from time to time at the university here, and they've given me a special chair and told me I can profess. You see, I am a philosopher and a scientist of sorts. A criminologist is what they call me. But I look at your key, and I look at the discarded chains, and for all that I've learned about punishment, I hesitate. I hover between despair and hope about us ever escaping these chains. I also wonder how, even with those kind eyes, you would judge me. How would you judge us? Perhaps you'd feel the same revulsion that you did when you first stepped into Bedford Prison. How can we allow so much ugliness to persist? If it was revulsion that energised your journeys, perhaps I can at least hope that if the Howard League for Penal Reform and all of its collaborators and friends in the wider movement can help to open people's eyes to the cruelty and injustice that's done in their name, then maybe we can revolt together and build not just a different kind of penal system, but a better society. Next time I'm in London, I promise I'll come and see you. Thank you for what you did. Sincerely.